We are going to go ahead and officially begin tonight at 6 o'clock, and so let's go ahead and get started. And uh, You know, we have started this series, we've called it Angels and Demons, and we started several weeks ago, on February the 8th, asking the question and trying to answer the question for two weeks in a row, kind of what does the Bible say about angels? And we've talked a lot about that, we've covered a lot of territory uh, we had some really interesting questions. Uh, I had people also who watched it online and sent me some questions. And I just want to encourage you, if you do have some questions along the way, and you're thinking, you know, I'd really like, I'm just curious about this, that last week uh, of, this, of, of our series, uh, we're just going to dedicate to kind of wrapping it up and, and, and looking at some of the questions. Uh, I've heard some really interesting stories. Some of you have come up to me and shared with me personal experiences that you've had. And a lot of people start the story with, I don't really know for sure if it was an angel, but I have no other explanation. And uh, some of you, I encourage you to, to share those stories uh, because I think that they can be helpful to other people as well. So uh, tonight we're, we're shifting from angels to the, to the next two weeks is going to be the devil and demons. And I wasn't really sure what order to put, put that in. They kind of both go together. Uh, but tonight we're just going to go ahead and, and start talking a little bit about the devil. Now, he's got a lot of different names. Uh, we have a lot of different ideas about who that is or how we're supposed to understand uh, the devil. Um, the Bible doesn't consistently use the same language to, to describe uh, the person we call the devil. In fact, there's a little bit of development of thought around the idea uh, so that by the time you get to the New Testament, you get a much clearer picture. If you look at a passage like Revelation 12, it's the scene of John, and he sees this dragon, and he's a serpent, and he's uh, called the devil, and he's called Satan. And some of the pictures sort of come together for us in the New Testament. But there's many different names. But tonight, before we get started and walk through just a little bit of both who he is and kind of the practical, a uh, few practical pieces of looking at him, I wanted to say a few things that I didn't give you a space in the outline uh, to, to, to just kind of in your mind to think about. So... I was looking on the outline where you could draw, maybe you could write at the very bottom at the back and you could write a few things down if you wanted to. But one of the things I want to say kind of as we start tonight, because I haven't had a chance to talk about demons, is that th from the best we can tell, there are uh, an, there is an unseen realm of creatures that God has made that are celestial, they're heavenly. They don't have human bodies like we think of. Some of them are called, we talked about cherubim and seraphim, and others are messengers who come and they appear as human beings to people so that they have experiences with them, and they're called angels. Now, there are also fallen angels, and, and we're next week we're going to talk about them. They're called demons, and this one figure that we call the devil happens to be one of them, and he fits into this category so here's a few things that we want to we want to identify about about him as well as demons, and that is, it's not that they're they're nobodies, it's that they have no body, uh, which is important to keep in mind because human beings were created with bodies. God took the breath, God took the earth, God made the people, but these are heavenly celestial beings that uh, do not have any. Uh, any bodies. And they fell. Well, in particular, we know that this one person, this one uh, figure, uh, the devil, fell before the human fall. The human fall is recorded in Genesis 3, you know, Adam and Eve. But before Adam and Eve could fall in, 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 and, and eat the forbidden fruit, there was already someone rebellious in the garden. And he had already experienced his own, ac his own activity uh, of a fall. In Genesis 1, 31, it says that God created the world. He saw everything he made, and behold, it was very good. So something happened between Genesis 1 and Genesis 3 when this serpent comes into the garden. There has been some kind of, of a fall. Uh, in the Genesis story, of course, he's never called Satan. He's never called the devil. He is called a serpent. But we actually know that he wasn't a serpent. 
we actually know that he was much more than what he appeared to be. He is, this is kind of another kind of thing to say here, he's the originator of sin. You know, we always blame sin on Adam and Eve, but if we're really going to put blame on someone, it, it, we need to blame on the devil. You remember the moment when God pointed his finger and said, who did this? And Eve's, uh, Adam said, don't blame me. And he pointed at Eve, and Eve said, don't blame me. And she pointed the, at the serpent, and he didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> well, he is the originator of all sin. So, you know, if we really, truly, we look at our, the brokenness of our world, we need to look at the point at the right direction. He is the one who said, I don't want to do this, and I'm going to rebel, and then I'm going to take people with me because he's so despised and hated people. The other thing I want to say here, just as we get started thinking about this, is that the devil is not the source of every evil. In fact, I don't know where evil started. Uh, the Bible never tells us where evil started. You know, this is actually called the philosophy of religion. It's a whole other course and taught down the hall in a different university or whatever. But it, we don't, the Bible never tells us where evil comes from. It just, it, it's, it, it's mysterious to its origin. It does tell us that when the evil will be no more, which is interesting. But he is not the source of every evil. He's the originator of sin. But when we look at the world today and we see something bad happen, yes, in some ways that's a fallout from the original fall. But it's not as though the devil is actively working in each situation to organize and orchestrate that. So if somebody says, like you hear this on television, you know, the devil made me do it. Uh, you're not important enough for the devil to be messing with you. I mean, unless your name is like Kim Jong or, you know, you've got some big country behind you. He's got bigger fish to fry. Let's be honest. I mean, you are important in your universe. But the reality is this is a single individual. Nobody. He is not an omni. He's not everywhere. But he is somewhere. And he is somewhere working in a very powerful and significant way. So I just kind of say that because I think it's helpful to think about that, you know, to, to, to remember that. All right, so let's go ahead and get started now as we walk through this outline a little bit. And I want you to kind of take in a, in a big way uh, kind of what the Bible says as a whole about the devil and also kind of how it impacts our lives. So the first thing I think I'd want you to know is when we look at the Bible, is that right from the very beginning, he had a plan. I mean, in the garden, he walks up to the most innocent people that you could, and he already had a plan. He was already, the Bible's word for this, scheming. That's a biblical word. It actually comes from the Greek word for scheming. <laughs> That's what it is. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, this is our great spiritual warfare passage we did a whole series called uh, on on armor up it says to put on the full armor of god so you could take your stand against the devil's schemes now if he's if he's a schemer he's he is he is planning and plotting and our struggle paul says is not against flesh and blood but against archon it's the greek word for for rulers but it's not talking about just human rulers or political rulers against authorities, against the powers, and then he just says it, of this dark world, of the, of, the, of the forces that are unseen, that are behind the scenes, that are working in very powerful places of government and society and institutions of the world, against spiritual forces of evil, and then he describes it in, in sort of the these heavenly or you might say unseen realms realms that we don't get to peer into uh but but they're but they exist so he is he's up to something and he is working and paul says therefore we need to be prepared he talks about putting on the full armor of god so that's the devil has a plan All right, i want to take a, quite a bit of time to talk about this part of the devil because one of the things that we see if we take the story of the serpent for example in the garden is that the first thing that he does is he tells something that isn't true. He organizes and orchestrates a situation where he is pretending to be something that he is not. He is trying to be on their side. He's trying to give them the impression that he has their best interest at heart. God said to you, but 
is it really true that you're going to die? God just doesn't want you to be like him. So the devil is ultimately a pretender. He is a con artist. But he's not a harmless phony. Uh, he, is a, he is a deadly scorpion. He is what you know, we sometimes call the wolf in sheep's clothing. And that's the picture that we get in, in Scripture. Uh, again, this passage reminds us of his scheming in 2 Corinthians 2. Paul says, if you forgive anyone, I forgive him. What I've forgiven, if there's anything to forgive, I forgive it in the sight of Christ for your sake. Now, he's just talking about working together with the Corinthians. And then out of nowhere, he says, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we're not unaware of his scheming. I mean, he is at work right there trying uh, to do that. So here's some things to think about in terms of this pretender who is, who is scheming. One of the ways that he applies his trade is that he appears, the Bible says, as an angel of light. Now, he is angelic. He is, you know, he has that, that, that previous identity. But he continues to present himself in that kind of way. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, I love this English translation of this word to describe his role. And no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. The, the word masquerade is such, such a picturesque word. You can just see him putting on this, this facade, and he is really this good guy, and he wants to give you this impression that he really has what is in your best interest at heart. But he is the devil in disguise, and that's who he truly is. He is, a, he is the serpent in the garden. <coughs> Think about that compared to how he's normally portrayed in art, in movies, in literature. He's red with a strange-looking tail and pointy horns on his head. He's grotesque, creaturely. I mean, who wouldn't say, that's the devil? But the scripture says that's not how he comes to us. He comes to us in a very appealing way. But he also does the things that God does. And this is what's interesting uh, in the New Testament is that we'll see him trying to do the things God does. We also see this famously in the Old Testament when the Israelites were trying to liberate, be liberated from Egypt. What did Moses do? He threw a staff down. A, it turned into a stake. What did the Egyptians do? They threw their sticks down and turned them in. He's going to turn the Nile into, into red blood. They're going to do their own tricks. One of the things the Bible tells us is that he plays a counterfeit game. He does the things God can do in a way, but it's always a counterfeit effort at it. You read in the book of Acts, there's stories like this at Ephesus. If you lead, lead, read later in the book of Revelation, which was also uh, written around Ephesus, there's similar stories about these kind of things. And in 2 Thessalonians, when Paul's writing to these, these Greek Christians about the future a man of lawlessness, son of perdition. You know, we sometimes call this figure the Antichrist. He says, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. And now I'm just, I'm perked up and I'm listening. Because Paul's about to tell us how Satan works. Here's the schemer. Here's the pretender. Here's the, the guy that's got the plan. He says he will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. The devil has tricks. He's, he's got things that are very convincing. It is no wonder a world of people have been, have been led astray. And his goal, it's interesting, is not to bring you to a greater degree of the truth. It is actually to convince you to believe a lie. And to become, as M. Scott Peck, the famous psychologist, and therapist, and, and best-selling author called, to become a people of the lie. To become a people who are caught up in the web of his deception and so be a part of his, of his grand, grand operation. In fact, that is one of the names that he's given in the New Testament. He's a liar. He's also a murderer, and he is a blinder. He lies, he murders, he blinds. It almost sounds like, you know, a, 
a movie from the 1980s or something like that, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles or something. These describe his, his role. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, The one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Remember, he's the originator of sin. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. That doesn't mean he was created sinful. There was a fall. But he is the first sinner. And he is the first to lead others into sin. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy what he was up to. He came to destroy the devil's work, his craft, his plan, his scheme, what he's trying to do. He's the original sinner and he's the originator of sin. In, uh, in John chapter 8, Jesus, who obviously you know was not well loved by the Pharisees, uh, they plotted every way that they could to have him killed. Were Jesus' confrontations with them led to this, this interaction in John chapter 8, where he, he finally just says to them, you know, you don't belong to Abraham. You think you do, but you don't. You actually belong to your father. You know, they thought of themselves as descendants of Abraham. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He and here we again, we kind of scoot up to the chair. We kind of listen in because Jesus is going to talk about who he is and what he is. He was a murderer from the beginning. I'm intrigued by that, aren't you? Not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native tongue, doesn't he? When he lies, he speaks his native language. You probably didn't even know Jesus said that, right? We would just say that as a saying. For he is a liar. He is the father of lies. I mean, it's hard to imagine that there was somebody that you could point to and say, that is the one who's the first one to lie, and the, everybody else is just following after. But he is the father of lies. He is the mass manipulator and liar. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul gives this other incredible insight into his uh, capability, his power. He says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, here he calls him by a different name. He calls him the God of this age. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. That's a strange turn of phrase if you think about it. We all know the phrase blinding the eyes of a person. Paul says he's blinded the minds. To blind your eyes means you can't see. To blind your mind means you cannot think clearly. You cannot understand or comprehend the truth. The God of the age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light. If you're blind, you can't see the light. But it's the light of the gospel, he says, that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. It's an incredible verse. And it reminds us uh, of this. So, you know, we sometimes ask this question, I, it's quite often asked of me, uh, Pastor, why are there so many people who don't believe in Christ? Why, in spite of our great missionary efforts or our great works, why, in spite of all of the Gideons who've given out a Bible and you can go anywhere and, and get one in so many places, are there still so many people who don't believe? Well, Paul's answer to that is because of the devil. <laughs> He's very successful in his scheming, and part of his work is to convince people not to believe the truth, but to believe a lie. So that's one of the ways <coughs> we think about him. So that's a lot on that one category, the devil is a pretender. <coughs> but I want to finish by looking at this part of it, which is to say the devil is a prince. Just kind of getting peas in there. Uh, it, means that it means that he is at the top of this organization. He is the criminal mastermind of his own mafia. Uh, he is the Don Carleone of his own criminal operation. He's at the top, and he regulates, and he runs this operation. This is not something people often think of. You know, in movies, the devil is often portrayed as kind of a lone actor, but not in the New Testament. He is a general. He is a, he is a king. He is a royal figure. He is a god of an entire organized system. So that in a passage like this, in the book of Ephesians, no less, when Paul's talking about 
you know, we get the passage eventually, you know, you're saved by grace. That passage starts by talking about how dead we are spiritually without Jesus. And what you used to live when he says, when you followed the ways of the world and you followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Now, I think Paul's tongue is in his cheek when he says this. Because, you know, he, he, he thinks of himself as the ruler of the kingdom. But in Paul's mind, his kingdom is, is, is ultimately thin air. But he is definitely the ruler of his kingdom. The spirit, and by the way, he identifies his nature right here. Somebody's going to say, how do you know that, that he's a spirit? How do you know he's not bodied? The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And then, and now I'm just walking you through all these verses so you can really kind of get a sense of this. Jesus in Luke's gospel, what did, what the, one of the biggest parts of Jesus' ministry was exorcisms, driving out demons. And in Luke chapter 11, when he has one of those conversations with the Pharisees, um, and he had just done this, this whole interaction takes place. Jesus was driving out a demon, Luke 11, 14. Uh, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute, and when the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. And some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Now, this is an old name that existed in the Greek literature used by the Jewish people for this guy from the name Baal. You remember that name in the Old Testament for a pagan god? Beelzebub was perceived to be the prince of, 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 of the demons, this, this pagan god. By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. Now, that's what they say because they're what witnessing these events take place. And as they're watching these things happen, they're saying to themselves, you know, this guy's pretty amazing. I don't know how he's doing this. He must be doing it by using, it, he must be somehow, you know, possessed by this super powerful demon and he's just putting on a, a show. But others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to them, Any kingdom divided, itself, uh, divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. Now, the reason Jesus says this is sitting there on the surface. It's because the prince of the kingdom of the air, Beelzebub, or whatever you want to call him, is ruling his kingdom. And he, then he just comes out and he says it. He says, if Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. So in other words, it makes absolutely no sense to say that I'm doing this by Beelzebub because why would the prince of demons be driving out his own demons? He, he wouldn't be fighting against himself. It'd be a civil war. But what we see in this passage is also another example of a spiritual war that is happening. That there is, from Genesis to Revelation, the world that we see in an unseen realm of spiritual powers. There is a conflict that is behind the scenes. And what the Bible is inviting us to do is to see the real war that's happening. There's a really strange verse in the Bible I want you to, I want to leave with you to think about. It's in, it's in the book of Jude. No chapters in Jude. Just verses, so it's you know you could go home, memorize the whole book of Jude, and come back next week, and and uh, you could not only know the song about Jude, but you would know the book of Jude. Just remember that. Remember the in Jude eighty nine it says in the very same way. So Jude is just laying out this whole argument after argument in his in his little letter. These dreamers, he's talking about these people who are trying to lead people astray. These dreamers pollute their own bodies, and they reject authority, and they slander cele celestial beings. So he's telling people, you shouldn't do that. And then he goes a little bit further, and he says, but even the archangel Michael, which all by itself, man, wouldn't it be interesting to know more about that, right? Because in the book of Daniel, you see this warring angel named Michael, and he runs the armies of God, and he's powerful and he even has that name Archangel, which means he's above the other angels. So God's got his own angelic organization at work. But even the Archangel, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses. Now, you don't read the story in the Old Testament. You can read it in Jewish literature if you want to look it up. And this, They love to tell the story that you know, nobody knew what happened to the body of Moses. And so there was this, this, 
there was this argument about what to do with it. And Michael and the devil are sort of having this, having it out, what to do with the body of Moses. It, it says that when that was happening, uh, the archangel, Michael, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against the devil. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. And to me, that is a reminder of how powerful the enemy is. And it is a reminder for, for, for these early Christians to, to understand and think about this in a way that we better have the armor of God. We're not taking him on. We're not going to win that battle toe-to-toe. Uh, we need someone to, to do that for us. Now, if, we're, if we think about the devil, it would be really terrible to not give you an application tonight. So go home and read James 4-7. That's the verse that says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So I think that's important to know. And so I've heard people say to me before, well, you know, I did that and, and it just didn't work. <laughs> it's like, well, how hard did you try? How long did you try? Well, I tried for 15 minutes or whatever, you know. <laughs> Jesus resisted the devil when he was in the wilderness for 40 days. Tonight is Ash Wednesday. Did you know that? It's the beginning of the Lenten season. It celebrates the experience of Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted. For 40 days, no food. No f- turn these ri- br- turn these br- these rocks into bread. I mean, how many times did Jesus have to say no to that? So, how long do we resist? Well, Jesus kept on resisting. There are two paths. John ten ten says the thief comes to s- kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus says, "I've come that you may have life." There are two paths. One leads to destruction. One leads to life. Uh, one is the path of life, and one is the path that leads to ruin. And one of the things that I think the scriptures are wanting us to do is to walk down uh, the right road. So I want to want to leave you with that, and then I want to leave you with one other kind of sad thing to say at the end of this. Uh, this guy is Michael Heiser. Uh, some of you have heard me talk about Michael Heiser. He's the author of a book called The Unseen Realm. This is the book. Best-selling New York Times. An Old Testament scholar who wrote about angels and demons and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and if you Here's the book that you might want to read because it's only this thick and it's a whole lot easier to read. <laughs> and then this is a really great book that he's done and another really good book that he's done, Angels and Demons. Michael Heiser died yesterday. He's, he's been in a long, long battle with cancer and for, uh, for a number of years. And uh, he was still doing his uh, spe- talking and, and teaching and sharing about his faith. He was a minister in a church in Florida and just a really brilliant mind and I had the opportunity on a number of occasions to spend some time with him was really impressed with him as a person and as a Christian uh, and just a really a gentleman and so I've spent a lot of time with him for the last few months as I've gotten ready for this and so I feel like I've I feel like I'm losing you know somebody that uh, that I care about uh, even though uh, and I've been praying for him for years and messaging him and telling him I've been praying for him so I'm I'm sad tonight, but as a lot of people were saying, he is, he is now in the unseen realm. And he is now, as we said before, guided by angels into the presence of God. And uh, he's in a better place where he doesn't have to deal with all of, of the stuff we got to deal with right now in, the, in our world. So uh, as you think about uh, all of these things tonight, uh, I was thinking about the devil. Because what he did in the beginning led to sin, but it led to death. And every one of us who's ever dealt with sin or death in our lives, it's the devil's fault. And Jesus said, I came to destroy his work. Let's join Jesus in destroying the devil's work. Let's resist him and let's lead down the road to the path of life. So let's pray together and be dismissed. Father, tonight as we've just taken just a few minutes to walk on a journey Uh, through the text and kind of a whirlwind of verses and god i just pray tonight for those in this room and those watching later on who might find themselves in a spiritual tug of war uh, that they find themselves maybe losing sometimes god i pray for their you to cover them with your grace and your mercy I i pray lord for those who find themselves in the midst of their own lenten struggle with sin God, I pray that you'd do for them what you did for Jesus. Send your angels to watch over them, to comfort them, and to encourage them. And Lord, I pray that your greater work 
of accomplishing in the destruction of the devil's work. Lord, may it come now. May it come through our lives and through our ministry, through our witness, until you come again. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.